for those that ever listen to me speak, might be boring, but not much has changed in the last year or so. Uh, but uh, yeah, after listening all these really fascinating talks by Velma and Anna and Selma, I'm, uh, I really wish we had an opportunity to have a real conversation uh, then rather than talk to a number of uh, muted uh, microphones and uh, inactive cameras. So uh, I did this many times with my students, but the first time I'm actually talking about my work on Zoom. So hopefully that goes relatively well. So I guess I should be sharing my screen. Go to the presentation mode. And I'm really hoping that if anybody uh, has any question, comments, please interrupt, you know, turn on your mic. And uh, and feel free to speak. I would really like this to be more of a conversation than one person talking. But anyway, uh, I always kind of start with this picture because you know, it's an important picture for me and it was uh, probably taken in 1984 and I'm here with my uh, best friend Sasha. Uh, in Sarajevo, uh, in, in Bosnia, then in Yugoslavia, where we grew up. Well, as most of you know, Sarajevo just maybe a couple of years previously hosted Olympic Games. I was about 20 years old. As you can see, played in a, in a band, among many other things. And as is the case with most people of, you know, of that age, across the world, the future was really not much of a concern, you know, even though in this picture, we, we seem to be trying hard to look as if we are concerned about something. But uh, only a few years later, in 92, the country of, of my youth and most of you in the, in the audience here ceased to exist. And uh, the band we had was well forgotten with good reasons. It would be anyway without the war. Uh, the aggression on the city of Sarajevo was well underway. The city was besieged by Serb forces. My friends were already, you know, scattered all over the world and uh, as refugees. And some of them were still in Sarajevo, obviously. And uh, by then I was already a soldier in the Bosnian army that was trying desperately to defend the city. This, sorry, this image uh, could have been taken from my apartment. It was taken by Kemo Hajic, a photographer, uh, but it was not taken from my apartment. It was probably apartment adjacent to mine or just below or about because I have the same view. And, uh, and I can tell you as much as you, if you are from somewhere else and not from Sarajevo or Bosnia, as much as you can't imagine your city or your country in flames, we also couldn't imagine it just a few months before this picture was taken. And, uh, but the problem is always that the fact that you can't imagine something doesn't mean it can't happen. And, Many people across the world are learning it now, especially in this a uh, little bit privileged societies where you know all of a sudden people live in a lockdown that they couldn't imagine uh, just a few months earlier. So this was '92. We fast forward another decade, and it's 2002, and I'm already like a three years uh, experience engineer in Bombardier Aerospace in some faraway city of Montreal in Canada, really the country and the city I didn't know much about, except that I knew that Montreal hosted Olympic Games, like, just like Sarajevo. But uh, here I am together with my colleagues posing proudly in front of our product. If we zoom out, this is us. And uh, if we fast forward another decade, 
Here I am receiving a Master's of Fine Arts degree at Concordia University here in Montreal. And uh, after I already completed a BFA, and as you can see, we are a family of photographers. So I, I cherish this one taken of me on the stage. So all this really to say that so much can fit into one's life, you know, and in my case, hopefully it was just about half of it. And uh, th this, this spread here is from, uh, from uh, a novel called Austerlitz by German writer W.G. Zebald, to whose work I kind of return often because uh, he dismantles this notion of an individual who has his or her own fate under control, you know? And, and that, that myth, especially in the Western world, in North America especially, is if, you know, if you're poor, if you're sick, if you are in trouble, it's mostly your fault, you know? So that clearly is able dismantles this notion in all his work and because every time he had things sorted out or he thought you know uh, everything was under control something then happens and kind of undoes it all so he tries to make sense of our existence uh, which often seems rather nonsensical in my case for sure my life to me when I look back now is completely nonsensical like throughout a few decades I lived completely different lives but, uh, you know, so it's important kind of that Zebald himself said that he never worked systematically, always embraced the discovery and chance, you know, because things happen along the way that you have no control of. And, and they do. So I'm going to go back to early 2000s. Uh, uh, this friend of mine from the Pierce picture, Sasha, Sasha Hemon, he, he was at the time living in Chicago. He was a, already a writer with a couple of books published. And uh, I was an engineer in, uh, in Montreal at Bombardier Aerospace. But very early in my corporate job, I kind of realized that I needed to do something else to keep myself sane from the corporate environment. So I started taking photographs and uh, I taught myself how to, mostly from magazines that I would pick up, you know, how to uh, develop and print. And I built a little makeshift dark room here at home. And uh, I was one of those people that I was not alone, but that, you know, would work full time jobs, but on the side, uh, photographing and printing after hours, you know. At the time, I really knew nothing about history of photography or contemporary photography, even less. And I'm just going to be showing you a few, few images that I was taking back then, just to give you an idea of yeah, what kind of whatever photographer I was, I guess. So in early 2003, Sasha was here visiting uh, for our annual skiing trips. And then I showed him some of these prints. Uh, I guess he got a bit intrigued. So on his return to Chicago, he called me and invited me to join him for a, a research trip across, across Eastern Europe for what's going to become the Lazarus project. So in novel basically deals with the real life events uh, that happened about 100 years earlier, real life death of Lazarus Auerbach, who was a young Jewish immigrant who came to Chicago in 1908. And a few months after his arrival, he got killed by the Chicago chief of the police. Uh, the idea that Sasha got for the book, for the novel and the project, basically while he was reading about this, this young man, somewhere he stumbled upon these photographs uh, in Chicago Historical Society archives, I think. And, uh, and that's where, where he actually got the idea for the project. And uh, this for particular photograph shows Lazarus Sobebark seated on a chair. Uh, there are people around. Uh, the guy behind the chair is a police officer. Uh, they are all very well alive, except for Lazarus, who is dead. He was, this is picture taken after he was murdered. 
And because he was unarmed at the time of a murder, the police had to justify this somehow, murder of an unarmed man. So they basically were showing his body to the public. And back then, phrenology was a thing, you know, it was taken seriously. So they were pointing, pointing to the features of his face and, you know, his nose, his cheekbones and his ears and saying that based on these features, he was clearly up to no good, that he was an anarchist and that, uh, you know, that somehow they tried to justify this murder, clearly revealing their racism along the way. And so almost 100 years later, this fictional writer and photographer go back to where Lazarus came from to the United States and kind of in an attempt to understand these places that he left behind. So that's actually what Hamon and I did in, in real life. And in May of 2008, the book was published. It included a number of my photographs as well as photographs from the Chicago Historical Society. And it kind of juxtaposes these uh, historical images with contemporary images and narrative. And while it was the photographs, my photographs were depicting this Eastern Europe at the time, when they were taken, they also stand in for the fictional photographer that's uh, one of the main characters in the book. So for the trip, I took a month long, long absence from work and off we went. Uh, I took one camera and one lens with me and uh, 40, 50 rolls of film. Uh, that's how much I knew. I mean, if something broke or I lost something like the Lazarus Project would be a very different book, surely without my photographs in it. And as for the photography, uh, they were kind of photographs that I knew how to, or the only type of photographs that I was doing at the time, they were traditional kind of road trip images. We spent most of the time while traveling you know, building up these characters and this fictional writer and photographer, we endlessly discussed what these two characters would do on this trip, uh, what would they talk about, even what the photographer would photograph. So we kind of inhabited the minds of these people. And, but also it was a book uh, that's about contemporary America, Bush America. It was the time of Iraq invasion and, it is also when the Abu Ghraib pictures came out. So that all kind of plays in that. So I'll go, I'll go quickly, sorry, through, through these images to show you the type of imagery that was taken on that trip. And The Lazarus Project was a very successful book. Uh, which some of you might know, and has been translated all over the world and won a number of awards uh, internationally and in the, in the States. It was a finalist for the National Book Award, the National Book Critic Award, and so on. That all, of course, is due to Alexander's uh, incredible talent as a writer, not due to my photographs, but for me personally, it really uh, was a very important uh, moment because it led to, to first exhibitions of my work that was tied into the book. So in Chicago and then also in Sarajevo in 2009. And this whole uh, collaboration with my best friend that in this case lasted for almost five years because we took the trip in 2003 and book was published in 2008. It really, <clears throat> sorry, changed my way of reading images, interacting with images, it changed my way of seeing the world around me and most importantly, it changed my way of participating in the world because it led, uh, it, it led to a few very radical changes in my life. Uh, among other things that influenced those changes, but uh, including the abandoning this engineering career in 2007 and in the spring of 2008, the book was finally published. And in September, I was uh, enrolled in the undergraduate photography program at Concordia University in Montreal here. So just, a, I guess, a fun fact uh, for those that might doubt what they, you know, 
what they do in life. I was 42 years old when I embarked on uh, studying at a university in photography as an undergraduate student. Uh, during the studies, uh, I'm not going to talk much about that, but it, it was a great experience. But I also, it kind of gave me the opportunity to, you know, not just do one thing, which for the, up to that point was, you know, black and white 35 millimeter photography, but actually to, to use all sorts of other means of visual storytelling, you know, from time-based images to, you know, different ways of installing photography to bookmaking and stuff like that. After graduating from undergraduate studies, I uh, promptly enrolled in the master's program. And being a graduate student, uh, actually for the first time in like since the war or since before the war, all of a sudden I had free time. Like I was not working eight to six every day. I had time to, for the first time in 15 years to reflect and to, to all of a sudden wake up in a very different world than I grew up in. Because up to that point, you know, like there was a war and immediately after the war, uh, me and my wife, we got our first child while we were still in Sarajevo. And actually that was the, the moment when we looked around and said, okay, maybe we could change the scenery. And then, uh, uh, you know, then you immigrate, then you're in this completely new world, and then you have to fight for, you get a job, and then you get a job, and then you have another child, and then, you know, it takes a lot of time to settle somewhere and, and build up a new life. So you don't really have time to reflect. But all of a sudden, when I was in this graduate school, I, 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 I was like, what the hell happened? What the hell happened to me, to my friends, to my city, to my country? what just happened, you know? And it was, it was a moment where I, first time I actually had time to reflect. But obviously reflecting and remembering that turned out to be a rather hard uh, problem solving activity. Also, when I entered this uh, master's program, I kind of, my, also my interests in, in art uh, and in photography started to to crystallize, started to gather under one umbrella, you know, it was all about memories and archives and, and, and history and, uh, and, and I became more and more interested in, you know, how images influence this memory and the role they play in this space where the, the historical uh, and fictional and personal interrelate, you know, and uh, more and more I started also to look and to use the visual records from the past and documents to kind of confront those present memories. And uh, by, the, by then I also knew that I'm not, you know, one of those artists that can create something out of nothing because there are amazing people that, you know, they get inspired, lock, them, lock themselves in a studio and they come up with amazing work. I, uh, for me, I, uh, everything I do originates in something that has happened or that could have happened, I guess, or that there was a potential for it to happen. So at that time, there was a, in the, uh, in the Montreal Museum of Contemporary Art, there was a big uh, exhibition retrospective by Andri Sala, who is an Albanian artist, uh, Back then he was studying in, in, in Paris. I don't know, he might be still living there. Uh, I don't know about too much about the personal history, but he's from Tirana from, and there was this big exhibition in, in the museum here. And he does this, you know, rather spectacular, large video installations, always with sound and music. And it's quite a big spectacle, but then, which was fine, but you know, but then uh, in this one small room, there was this on a small TV screen, there was this movie that he did or film, not the movie, it was a film, more like a documentary film that he did when he was a student. It was called Intervista. Uh, uh, it was really a wonderful film. 
And uh, basically what happens is when he was going back from Paris to Tirana in his home, his parents' house in the basement, he found this uh, newsreel film that was uh, the, containing the images of, uh, of a Congress of a communist, Albanian Communist Party from 20 years earlier. And the, this newsreel film shows this young woman giving a speech and uh, uh, she was the leader of this communist youth alliance or something. And it turns out to be his mother. And she was giving this speech and everything, an interview after, and then there's this, he's looking at these images, but he can't know what she was talking about because back then the, the images and the sound were recorded on separate tapes. There was no tape with sound, so it was just images. So he hires a lip reading specialist from, from a school for deaf person in Tirana to kind of decipher what she was saying. So he subtitles that. And then his film intervista is him showing to his mother this, this film subtitled and now she's sitting there with him there watching this film and she has to kind of confront her younger self and, and read what she was saying. And she's in a complete disbelief that she was saying the things she was saying 20 years ago. So Intervista was really uh, like a uh, important discovery for me at the time. Uh, it hinted at these possibilities of working with personal stories that are also part of a larger historical context. Uh, Selma was talking uh, last, on Tuesday, you know, about this, this whole question that I think many artists ask themselves, why should I tell something that's very personal? Why should this, you know, why me? Why should I do it? And, you know, why would anybody care? And it's a legitimate question. It's a very good question, you know. But when I watched the interview, I realized that it could be done. You know, it, it could be, you know, it could have a value of sort. And, and uh, it, it, I watched the interview at the time when I was starting to think about my prisoner story, which is something that was the... the particular event that happened to me during the war. And uh, in basically 1994, as I was in, in the Bosnian army, uh, just about 30 kilometers away, my father was in a Bosnian army prisoner war camp. So, so he was, I was their soldier and he was their prisoner. So he was my prisoner in a way. Uh, so we lost contact, me and my father, in a very early 92. He was, he was a low-ranking officer in the Yugoslav army. He was a Zastavnik, and uh, he was at his post uh, somewhere, Pazaric or Tarchin. Uh, it was a very small, some kind of post with a, with a bunch of kids. This was way before the, the, the aggression really happened. It's, this is... April still before the whole blown out aggression happened. So he was captured and put in silos in uh, Tarchin, where he remained for the rest of the, for the whole duration of the war. So, uh, but I didn't know uh, any of that for the longest time until Red Cross got access to this, uh, to this camp, which took them, uh, I think, a year and a half. And then uh, we got the first message that he's actually alive. So in 1994, the, 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 somebody in the army had this uh, great idea that my father and I could be reunited or that I could go and visit him. Uh, so this father-son meeting was arranged. Uh, the the t TV crew was deployed. Uh, Selma was talking last uh, on Tuesday about this tunnel, so I had to go through tunnel across Sigman and to Pazaric, where I spent a few days in some barracks with a completely unknown uh, 
people around me and uh, there was it was because at first I said no way I don't want this to be filmed and then there was this psychological war where they kept me there for uh, for days until I gave up and uh, so Presumably, clearly on the opposite side of the war, my father and I kind of met for a few minutes and we exchanged this embraces. Uh, camera really recorded us sobbing and crying, our oh, humiliation at, at, at that moment. And uh, we were, you know, playing in somebody else's script. And then uh, two months later, I was sitting in the barracks with, with with my friends and uh, all of a sudden on the evening on a prime time daily news there's this a little contribution saying oh today something wonderful happened uh, you know this son visited his father in the prison blah 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 so there was this whole news uh, clip based from my nightmares and prime time daily news so 18 years later, I'm sitting in Montreal starting to, you know, reflect and think about all these things. And then I realized there is a recording of this somewhere. There must be, you know. So I retrieved that recording through some of my friends in, in Sarajevo. And when this disc arrived to my home in Montreal, I knew that since, you know, before even opening it, that it's basically simultaneously a propaganda piece just like everything produced in the war has its propaganda purpose. Uh, but it was in the same time historical document. And also it is a record of my most intimate personal experience. And still unclear, like when, when one of these things stop and another one kind of begins. So, but I didn't know really what, if I want anything to do with this, and I, uh, I uh, but then I called my father who also survived the war and he's fine. Uh, and I told him that I was in touch with Zvon Komaric. And he was like, who's Zvon Komaric? I said, I remember when, you know, when I came to Silos and, you know, the guy that uh, interviewed us both, you know, the reporter. And my father to my shock said, I was not interviewed by Zvon Komarch. I have no idea who that is. I was interviewed by a woman. And I had this really convincing, concrete memory of us, you know, standing and Zvon Komarch in between us and he's interviewing us. And so this is probably up to that point in our lives, the most traumatic moment in our lives, but we had uh, really different memories of it. And that's, uh, and that's when I decided, okay, I should maybe work with this a little. Then clearly when I watched the, 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 the video later, I realized I was also interviewed by a woman. Uh, I even remembered her name. And uh, it was uh, my memory that I had at the moment was completely constructed because for, you know, that just like memories sometimes are, or most of the time, and uh, it was false. But Zvonko Maric was clearly there in a role, because as he was during the war all over the place, uh, on the, you know, doing this reporting, but he was probably a producer and, you know, he was there and somehow I constructed this memory of him interviewing me while it wasn't the case. So I also, uh, it was, I was also a little bit irritated by all of this. And then I, then I decided that I want to shift my focus and, and recreate or reimagine uh, something that led to this moment, but that was also not recorded on camera. So there would be no camera to screw up with my memories. And I, I came up at the end with this sequence of sound and images called my prisoner and, uh, in its final form, because the work had few iterations. Uh, it's a video that reconstructs this event of, that happened on April 3rd, I think, 94. And it shows this young man being escorted by an uh, intelligence officer to, to, to visit his imprisoned father. And as they travel, 
and this is based on 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 uh, real events because when they were taking me there first i was heavily drugged because i was i needed something to calm me down and then i was in the back seat of a car with this uh obavish tyats uh who who kind of organized all of that and we were driving through this beautiful world through the woods clearly there is no traffic it's the middle of the war and uh and you know how in the war you know most of the music you hear on the radio is like you know patriotic songs or some folk or whatever but then the driver turns on the radio and there's silence in the car nobody's talking and the driver turns on the radio and then i recognize this this music, I know what it is. It took me a while to, to figure out what it is. And it was Shine On Your <laughs> Crazy Diamond from Pink Floyd playing in, in the car as we are driving to Silos. And, and so to break the silence, and that was those were the only words spoken in this moment, I, uh, I turned to the guy and I say, uh, uh, good music, dobra musica. And then he says, yeah, Jean-Michel Jarre. And uh, it was such a lovely moment and, uh, you know, he did not recognize the track. Uh, I was completely shocked that Jean-Michel Jarre exists in his mind at all. And then, uh, you know, so I wanted to recreate. So at the end, this whole My Prisoner story is a composite of autobiography, you know, documentary and fiction, and it kind of navigates through that space. So, there are a few installation shots that's boring but uh i uh, think maybe i could if there is interest show a little clip from that so i basically combined uh what i shot a few years ago uh, in sarajevo with some of my friends and uh and archival footage And because we are warriors, more than anything, I know everybody's more interested about the archival footage. So I'm going to just play that a little bit. You can still hear me and everything, right? Claudia? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Mm. I'll make sure that... and so on, and then we end up sitting down. I still have the same cigarette from the beginning to the end, and then this basically goes on until, until they say, okay, that's enough. And that's the moment when they say that's enough. And then, uh, then they, they, they take him out of the house. There's also at the end, when they, uh, 
Yeah, there is kind of an interesting and beautiful moment when I, I'm leaving the room. And he tells me, take care, be good, listen to what you told. And then, uh, yeah. And then sometimes a few minutes later, they uh, take him away and I, uh, we both get interviewed by, by the female victim. So, we still all there? You can hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. So basically, that's just a little part of uh, my prisoner work. And uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, I, I probably took already too long, so I'm not gonna talk about this project uh, in Core Odyssey. I'm gonna just skip, skip uh, this for now, maybe return to it later. I don't wanna keep you for way too long. Uh, I will talk about this. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I was never a person that collect clips from the newspapers back in the day. And, uh, but a few years ago, as I was cleaning my clutter, you know, of papers, I came upon this article that I cut from Montreal Gazette in 2007 and stored it and forgot about it. But then I found it when I was cleaning and it basically talks about how in 1988, to mark the 150th anniversary of the invention of photography, Montreal designated six streets within this new to be built housing development to be named after important historical photographers from Montreal. So this new neighborhood was drawn and the names of these photographers were put on the map. So every official map of Montreal since 1988 Till 2007, for 19 years, every official map printed had this neighborhood uh, with these streets of these photographers uh, here that was actually never been built and the names have never been inscribed on street signs. And finally in 2007, that's where the article came out, the city administration, you know, scrapped the project. So removed uh, the names from future maps, never to be printed again. So I, I was clearly very intrigued by this article. I didn't know that that's possible, that there are actually neighborhoods on our maps that we look at that actually don't exist. So I, uh, it was news to me, maybe, maybe everybody else knows that that's possible, but I, I did not. And uh, so eight, nine years later, I, I located this on uh, Google Earth, this, this whole location, this neighborhood that was supposed to be. And it, it really is uh, like a wasteland up to today. There's nothing really there, it was a piece of woods. Uh, but I don't know why at the time I was, I, how did it occur to me, but I, I typed in Rue William Notman or Street William Notman, and it actually showed up on Google in the middle of nowhere. And he was not alone. There was other photographers' streets there, you know, and uh, that was really interesting to me. So I decided to visit the location of that neighborhood, and I, I came upon this, and that's a piece of wood that's very close to the river. So it was constantly under water. And so I visited uh, often in different seasons. And uh, it was really a beautiful place. Uh, so at the time I also started to kind of do lots of research and readings and watching films that deal with this whole 
space and place and cultural meanings of it and such. But I also needed to learn a few practical things. So I went to the city of Montreal. How do you get the street names? You know, what needs to happen? How are these decisions made and, and so on? So I, I made some contacts in, in toponymy department and I did, you know, they sent me to the archives where I had to go through microfilms and retrieve all these documents. It was lots of fun. But it was all uh, lots of research, but it was just a pretext for what I really felt I needed to do. Uh, as, the, as magical as this location is, I felt just like documenting it, photographing it or recording is not really what was interesting to me. But the, this idea of a, of a potentiality of a potential neighborhood wouldn't let go. Like there was supposed to be a neighborhood with its buildings, its shops and schools, and there was supposed to be some lives lived there and kids growing up, you know? And it's never gonna happen, but also you can never take away the potentiality of it. So I was interested in this, but I really didn't know what to do. And then one night I was reading, uh, I came, uh, there was a Borges story called The Circular Ruin, in which he, the, the whole short story is about the man who goes to sleep at night only with one goal, to dream up a person, to dream up a man and to insert that man into reality. So then I realized that's, that's what I should probably do, dream up some people. And I decided to dream up these two fictional characters who kind of grew up in that neighborhood. And so I wrote a script, it was Gustav and Catherine. And, you know, she seemed to be a visitor and, but clearly with a connection to the neighborhood uh, and, he lives there and uh, they just get together. She comes and then they walk around through this water and, and woods and talk as if they're walking through the neighborhood and they talk about people, events and stuff, just like we all do when we go back to, you know, where we come from. And uh, it was really a project about potentiality or unrealized dreams somehow. And, resist the actual kind of and, uh, my goal was to you know that the characters kind of make us consider the power of storytelling because they exchange these stories constantly and then power of imagination as well as as power of images but images not to record reality but rather to kind of produce new reality and I think I'm going to share just a little, sorry for the noise, just a little uh, clip from that. The work was called Nothing Will Surprise You Here. But clearly it was also, as I was doing it and as I was writing the script, it was really influenced by, you know, who I am and where I come from. So I'm going to share a minute or two. Remember that boy who grew up here? His father worked in a water treatment plant just behind the hill. What? His family was struggling and his only way out, he told us, was to join the army. Leon Laberge, that was his name. He went to serve and ended up in a war that dragged on for quite a few years. It felt so long that after a while, all the noise of the battlefield firearms, grenades, people shouting, wounded screaming, birds singing during ceasefire, leaves rustling in the wind. All that noise became a um, monotonous hum, just like the hum of the neighborhood plant where his father worked. And all that time all he wished for was peace, he said. 
And then one day, as his unit was in trenches, the news reaches them that a peace agreement has finally been signed. And so they were taking in the long anticipated news. They heard a stray bullet zip by high up in the trees. Our boy Leon thought how that might be the very last bullet of the war. So inexplicably, he said afterwards, he fired another one straight back into the enemy lines. The last kiss? Perhaps. But then the other side wanted to kiss some more. They responded and the battle started and continued for a few weeks. No peace agreement could stop it. Many were killed. Leon lost his legs in that battle. He was a nice boy. This place, this place is my true refuge. A kind of sanatorium. Even if there are no remains of our past lives. Or maybe because of it. You know what I miss? I miss being surprised. Surprised? Yes. Like waking up in the morning, looking out the window, and discovering that everything has been covered in snow. Then getting ready while listening to the Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> yes, you're back. And by the way, a few minutes before, Anna was saying, please don't skip when you were skipping on some projects. So you have time. Okay, so this uh, nothing will surprise you here is, uh, is uh, like uh, there's 20 something minutes of this film about these two people and then that was the whole installation it had some other elements including a few of the photographs. Uh, then uh, I want to show something that I because it's clearly connected to, to this whole uh, series of uh, that you organized that uh, it was never really meant to be a project, but with a few friends of mine, we were doing a, a kind of a group exhibition here, and I really didn't know what to do. And then one of them suggested, because seen over the years, these images that I that are always pretty much the same from my apartment in Sarajevo. I mean, here in Montreal, and I think it's the case in most most uh, immigrants. You know, you live. I live with images of Sarajevo all the time, you know, they're on my phone, they're on my social media, they're on, uh, uh, on my walls, uh, you know, like they are everywhere in my wallet, you know, so some kind of, you know, uh, like memories, some are just deep inside me, you know, like it's so. Uh, now I'm lucky to go back to Sarajevo, every opportunity I have, you know, and I, and I use every opportunity I have to go back. That's why particularly this year was so difficult because I did not end up going back to Sarajevo at all. But many displaced people do not have that privilege um, for many different reasons. And, and, uh, and I'm grateful so that we could still, you know, Bosnians go back. And uh, so whenever I kind of come back, as soon as I step out from the airplane, you know, I feel like I just walked into the real thing of those images that haunt me when I'm in Montreal. So anyway, for this little project that was never meant to be a project, it's, uh, it's basically a bunch of images that are focused around this uh, apartment building across from me called Shivica. People from Sarajevo know it. 
or matchbox in English, uh, which kind of dominates the view from this home of my previous self and uh, that I left two decades ago. And uh, so I, I basically, you remember this uh, Kemo Hajit's photo from the beginning of the presentation. So it's pretty much the similar view. But, you know, like I, I'm sure all of us, when we go back to where we come from, you know, there's these things that we photograph, especially now with phones, like constantly without even thinking. And one of those things for me is this view from my apartment. And uh, yeah, some are older, some are newer. Like this one was 95 or 96, sorry, but we were still in Sarajevo. And I think this was the latest in the set. And then the oldest image in the set was actually from 1993. It was the day of my wedding, uh, July 10, 1993. It's probably the worst time in our lifetime to get married, but we did. We had to run across the, the sniper alley, as they call it, the main boulevard to the Obstina municipality building uh, with a bunch of friends, which was uh, totally crazy when I think about it now. So this was taken that day. Clearly Sarajevo was, you know, there's not a single car or a person because it would be a suicide to be on these. We, we were basically living on the front line. And uh, yeah, so I, so I put all these views together and it came out as a, as a little, project that was exhibited here in a gallery. Also something I did recently is uh, this uh, exhibition called In Seeing, There is No Right, No Wrong. Uh, basically it started from, uh, I, I revisited my negatives archives and uh, I don't remember what I was searching for, but uh, I spent, you know, time with magnifying glass, looking over my contact sheets, and uh, but more and more as I was looking, and uh, maybe because I'm not such a good photographer or something, but you know, the most interesting thing for me were these black squares, that the rectangles that that were there. So basically, they would appear once in a while. But they would represent the exposure that can go wrong. So basically, I screw up when I took a picture. Uh, with some of them, it would be easy to identify where they were taken because they would be in the sequence of images in the middle of it. But sometimes it's in between two unrelated things. So you really don't know what the photographs was supposed to be. And basically these images that offered no visual clue became the focus of my interest. So I uh, decided to treat them just as I would do any photograph that I find important. And I went to the black and white dark room, printed them large on a, on a fiber-based beautiful paper and uh, the traditional process. And uh, so together with some images that offer some content, however, you know, abstract, the, the, it became this project in seeing there is no right, no wrong. And, but these black, dark, or I would rather say dark than black, they were not really black. Prints were the, the focus of the, of the show. Okay, I, I'm coming close to the end. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about something that, uh, that's going on right now. But basically, Sasha, Sasha Hamon and I, we started it back in 2016, working on this new project slash book, which will be a collection of stories about Bosnians who were refugees some 20 years ago. And, uh, but now they, they live wherever they live. And uh, we talked about this for a while. And then, then when this whole, uh, you know, so-called migrant crisis where, where, you know, like this whole depiction of immigrants and migrants and refugees uh, was really sickening uh, from media to, to, uh, to countries and states. I, I particularly feel 
ashamed, feel ashamed by the way Bosnia, uh, you know, treats these people, especially we should know better. And uh, so we, we decided that, you know, like we should maybe tell stories of some individuals who were refugees and, you know, and I mean, these are fascinating stories. I, re I mean, my story is a, you know, you know, it's completely unremarkable. It's nothing, it's sort of like every Bosnian has a story like that, but uh, some of these people and their stories is, 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 is really unreal, even for Bosnia, what people went through in their lives and especially during the, the, the war. And um, and all the decisions they had to make, all the circumstances, all that. So we we had quite details conversations with people. We would go wherever they live, and and uh, these are some just some of the pictures of the settings in which we would talk with them, wherever they were comfortable in talking, and uh, so. Sasha will be clearly writing a, a book uh, of these stories, but I also simultaneously work on a kind of a different way to present this material in different circumstances and maybe for different audience in a, in a some kind of a, you know, institution or gallery or, you know, something that's not a book. And uh, it's uh, the stories, I understand that these stories are very, it could be very intimidating for people who are privileged, who never had to leave their homes, who never lived through such traumatic experiences. And uh, so the way I, I decided to approach these stories is that I would actually transcribe the interview in full, but I would admit, it would be just uh, keywords. So that would be the whole life up to that point, you know, and because no one experience, because people, you know, when, when, when they find out about somebody, they're, they're a refugee or whatever, that they survive some war, that kind of defines them. But not one single experience defines a human being, you know, because we kind of all live the same life. Yeah. You know, we all are we born, we are children, we go to school, we fall in love, then you look for jobs, then there's family or no family, doesn't matter. It's like... 99% of our lives are around the same issues, but for some people, at certain point, something happens that's outside of their control and then they have to deal with it. Like this was the case with, with, with Bosnians, for example. So I uh, basically transcribe, but it's just a barrage of words from these interviews as, pe as people are speaking. So, so when somebody who is say in the gallery and hopefully that's gonna happen soon, I'm supposed to have a, an exhibition with this work uh, uh, in the coming year. Uh, when somebody reads through these, you know, most of the time it's very familiar things to their own lives, you know, when they read about games and as a children or jobs or whatever. But then at one point, you know, as they say, shit happens, and uh, in our case, you know, there was lots of details about traumas and events that, that people lived through, through during the war. And also this whole immigrant experience that's, you know, full of, full of stories. So I think that's that. I, I just want to point out that I... Uh, while obviously I love working on my on my projects, I changed my whole life in life in order to to be able to do that. The particular pleasure gives me the all kinds of collaboration that I worked with my friends, very good friends from Bosnia. Well, I, I mentioned Sasha Hammond a few times, but I. Uh, for many years, I traveled with Amila Buturovic, who is a professor at York University, and we documented uh, medieval cemeteries around Bosnia and Herzegovina that uh, she wrote a wonderful book about called Carved in Stone, Etched in Memory. 
and we had a few exhibitions uh, with uh, Azraq Shamia as well. And then finally, we had an exhibition in the National Museum, in the Bicycle Museum in Sarajevo, two years ago, I think, 2018. Uh, also, Adis uh, Pezic was there, the sculptor. And uh, so this, this picture on the top left is actually when Azra, Amila, and I put a show in, uh, in uh, in Toronto, in the Ismaili Center. Then uh, also recently I did, uh, Azraq Shamia did uh, this wonderful book. She was editor of the book for Aga Khan Foundation to uh, architect Architecture of Coexistence. And I was commissioned and I went to the Biela Jamia to White Mosque in, uh, in uh, in Isoko and uh, spoke to people there, did a bunch of interviews and a photo essay that was published in the book. Uh, this image here is from Iceland uh, with my very good friend Sasha Savic. I kind of shot a film, he's an avid fisherman and he, he wanted to do this film to help the preservation of salmon and, and we traveled a lot in the northern hemisphere and i uh, i worked with him this this here is uh actually i did a did a work with uh, goga grozdanich who's also a good friend from sarajevo she lives in philadelphia and uh, she's writing uh, a comprehensive book about zia dizdarevich and his life and uh yeah so i'm gonna stop sharing because I, I really want to see some faces uh, hope you're still there. Okay, there are some people. So it was, uh, yeah, I, uh, am I done? I think I'm done. It's, uh, it was a great talk. Oh, thank you. Somebody saying something, you know, like when I, when I teach, I, uh, I encourage my students to, to, to at least put the sound on, you know, so when they, I don't know, flush the toilet or, or you know, cut the onion or whatever, so I can hear something going on. It's, it's really weird to speak to so many muted microphones. And uh, yeah, I probably forgot many things that I wanted to say, but uh, I think everybody had enough. I've been talking for more than an hour, so. And I, you know, any questions, comments, it would be lovely to hear from you. Maybe also Selma and Velma and Anna, um, they were with us uh, from last week and this week also. Feel free to just ask any question. Uh, I, I do have um, some questions for you and, uh, and I would like to go back to uh, the work My Prisoner because that was the, the work that caught my attention uh, at the beginning when, uh, when a common friend put us in contact and then I was, um, I was uh, looking at your website and then uh, I read about that work, My Prisoner, and then I realized that that work somehow was familiar and then it took me some time to realize that I actually read about that work in one of Alexander Schemon's uh, books and then finally I connected the dots and it was particularly interesting for me. There are lots of dots to connect in the Bosnian world, you know. <laughs> um, and it was very interesting for me. I think when I discovered the, your work, I was, uh, I mean, I was still writing my thesis about contemporary art from Bosnia. And I think um, the whole idea of Kuma was uh, in my mind. And then I, I invited you to the first summer school to present um, your work two years ago. So um, it, it's such a personal work and um, um, maybe one of the most difficult works that you um, worked on in your career. And I remember talking about that work. Uh, um, we were saying that, you know, somehow for all people uh, from Bosnia um, working with art is a sort of therapy and maybe that was healing for you, that process of working on some of the 
one of the most traumatic uh, events that happened to you during the, the war in, in Bosnia. So I'm just asking you if you can tell us a bit more about that. And this would be a way to encourage, you know, the people that follows us at Kuma to, to realize that as you were saying, and as we were discussing also with Selma, we all have stories and, um, and our voices are unique. So we all, I think, deserve to tell our stories and uh, hopefully- yeah, we'll well, Many people do it and do it very well. And, you know, it's like, I mean, I don't know, but this whole healing thing, I mean, yeah, I guess, but you know, when I, when I looked at this material, cause I was, it was, it was quite removed like 18 years after it was made. And when I started working with that, I, uh, I was looking at somebody else. You know, it was really like, yeah, I, I know it's my experience and I know, but it was, it was, it was as if I was looking at some other people. I think also partially it was because of the type of material. Because uh, <laughs> this, this film, the original, not mine, but the, the, the original footage from the, it's such a beautifully shot, you know, it was clearly done by a professional from the Bosnian TV some amazing cameraman because there are there are points where he zooms in and out and moves around it's, it's just such a fascinating thing to watch for me that i you know like i mean clearly it is traumatic and uh, and uh, we all but you know like bosnians with the experience we have i think anybody who is from bosnia who had any conscious life before the war started even people that didn't uh, we all have some kind of trauma. We all have PTSD. Like people who left before the 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 war, they do have it too. You know, it's like nobody is exempt from it. It's uh, it's it's part of who we are right now, and it will be. I think my children who had a beautiful childhood here, and you know, like they just visited Bosnia, and they're adults now. Even they probably have a little bit of PTSD. PTSD inherited just by, you know, hearing the story of being bullied. But I mean, this whole art, art you know, like, uh, and healing of art. I think I enjoyed the process. I really enjoy, I felt I'm doing something important for myself and, and when I was working on it, but did it really help in my healing? I, I, I would not uh, sign up on it, you know, it's like, yeah, I've not, I don't, you know, I find art is important in so many levels and, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that it heals much without support from some other aspects of life. What about the role of photography in this process? You know, how you describe yourself as a, diasporic person, even if yours was a choice. So you chose to leave Sarajevo in 98 and to start a new life in Canada. And then somehow you're talking about Sarajevo and showing those beautiful pictures from your apartment um, and saying that those images from Sarajevo are haunting you. So it's like there is this split from, you know, that, that will never heal somehow. Yeah, well, you know, like, I love Sarajevo. I always did, and I always will, no matter what happens. And, no, you know, it's, like it's just something that, it's a, it's a fact that will never change, no matter what. But I, I'm clearly, you know, like, I'm surrounded by images from Sarajevo, you know, from, you know, that thing on my wall is about Sarajevo, and, and it, they are everywhere. Uh, I, I mean, haunted is a hard, hard, hard uh, maybe not the, the most, the, the best word to describe it, but it's part of my life every day, you know. And then, then when I go back, I really feel like I'm, I'm entering in the real thing of those images, you know. And it's, uh, so, I mean, the role of, of photography is like, you know, it, it is uh, often, you know, in conflict with what I remember, you know, about particular events. And that's, what, that's what's really interesting for me. Also, you know, like what's, what's interesting from a personal level 
you know, I, you are not, you know, when you look at photographs of other people doing some of the projects or whatever, you're looking, you know, like, you're looking for wow, you're looking for something to catch your attention. But when I look at images from my past, from anybody's past, from Sarajevo, from Bosnia, that's kind of, I, I, I am more and more or less and less intrigued by wow or hmm. I'm really like looking at those images that have really seemingly nothing to offer. It's like just a, just an ordinary, ordinary image of something, you know, and they, they, you know, for someone like me, and I'm sure that they, they still have the power, you know, while as an outsider, when you, when you refer to look of images of some other place, you know, like you're looking for, you need something to catch your attention. When I look at images from Bosnia, I need nothing. I, as, a, as, a, as soon as I recognize the place, I'm, I'm hooked, you know. And uh, yeah, but in, in personal life, they often like contradict what I remember. And uh, that I think I, I like those contradictions. I embrace them. And uh, yeah, but it's, it, it, I mean, this whole photography thing, it's, uh, uh, it's another language that we have to deal with now. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so much of it that, you know, you really have to learn how to read it and become literate in reading uh, images. And, I, and I'm not sure, like, I think that's like a next step in uh, the, the literacy of visual reading that, you know, with students and with uh, all across, you know, you know, it's not like, it shouldn't be just photography students learning about it, but everybody, just like we all learn how to read and write, because it, the photographs, you know, we are so bombarded with it from every angle, from every source that uh, unless we can, you know, make sense of it, we can easily be, yeah, uh, taken astray. Is there anyone who would have a question or comments for Belibor? Yes. Hi, Belibor. Hey, Paras. How are you? Excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to ask, uh, like, in your work, because you live away from Bosnia now for many years. Um, I don't know, like, because I, I personally feel like there's this middle ground living away from a place that you come from and you've been living in this, like you come from place A, live in place B, like what's the place or, or how do you define that middle ground sort of, you know, in your work or, or how you deal with the material that you use? Well, honestly, I, I feel very po fortunate that I actually had these two, you know, like, and uh, I, I feel fortunate, I mean, even though, I mean, many Bosnians were forced to leave. And I was not, I, I left on my own after, you know. So, so it, it, I, I chose this other place, I, you know, and the, they coexist. Uh, they are almost one for me right now, you know, it's like, and because I'm privileged so, that I can travel from one to the other. And they occupy my mind in the same, you know, like from both places kind of equally. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a tough question. I don't, I don't really know what's in the middle and if there is a middle, I don't think there is a middle. I think it's just like, you know, it's all together there. Unless you have a suggestion how you deal with it, with the, with the I, with it yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I wanted, um, thank you for the talk, by the way, and I was in tears during some of it, actually. Um, but uh, I wondered if there was some kind of connection between your engineering world and your kind of forensic eye when it comes to your artwork that kind of investigative approach. Is there, is there a parallel at all anywhere there? None whatsoever. 
I, I mean, I, <laughs> to be honest, I forgot. I mean, I worked significant number of years, eight and a half years as in engineering here, and, you know, but as if it never happened. I was just like, uh, once, once I, I left, it, it kind of disappeared. I, I guess it, yeah, no, it, it, I don't see in my work any, any parallels uh, to, you know, or, or really connection to, to that experience. It's probably the only experience that did not influence what I do, uh, or maybe that I just can't recognize it. Uh, but yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Yes, please, everybody. Um, you mentioned Zebald at the beginning, and I, I think he he made um, a comment about some kind of island away, like kind of isolated place being something you could call home, home being a kind of a childlike concept. And it's sort of similar to Saeed's idea about kind of this idea of the home being very fragile, like existing within the experience of exile, but also just the experience of having home. But I, I, I guess I, I'm using that to kind of ask a question about writing and your work and, and the way that maybe do you, do you see a way in which they're kind of intricately connected because you worked with Hamon on his book and you work on on two different books? I wonder if there if if there's some writers who have a kind of ekphrastic way of approaching writing. Do you have a kind of a writerly way of approaching your photography? Well, I don't know, but I mean, uh, I read a lot of literature. I I love it, and I I. I I guess through Sasha, I met lots of writers and uh, interacted with quite a few of them. And I, uh, but you know, like this whole idea of home, I remember once we were sitting, uh, that was actually here in Montreal, Sasha, myself, Ravi Haj, who's uh, of uh, Lebanese origin, also a writer here in Montreal, and John Freeman. And there was some event where four of us had something in, in, a, in a magazine and there was like a, a launch. And so I'm sitting with all these writers and the question is like, home, what is home, you know? And they all have this brilliant, beautiful, you know, you know, description of home. And, and, and home really is all of those things, you know? Like, but it's it's for everybody. Everybody has their own, you know. It's like it's not uh, it's not one this beautiful description that's applicable to all of us, you know. So I mean, writing has a I'm sure it influenced me a lot. I I read a lot when I'm working, and uh, and you know, like uh, this this in seeing there is no right nor wrong. This little project that I saw that I showed, uh, you know, that, that that's a quote from a from a from a novel. Uh, it 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 comes everywhere, you know. But uh, uh, in my own writing, you know, that's that's what I have Sasha for, and all these friends, you know, they can do it, you know. I, I don't have to, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's intricately, it's, it's there. But you're telling stories with your image. I mean, you're telling stories through that too. You're doing a kind of writing. About storytelling is really what interests me. I think, uh, you know, like this, this whole, the power of storytelling and, uh, you know, imagination and, and somehow how images work with that, you know, like, uh, but there are so many different ways to, to tell the story. You know, there are no recipes, there are no, you know, like it's a, everybody's going to do it differently and that's the beauty of it. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, your work. Um, I have a question. You know, you talk so much about how you kind of surround yourself with these images from uh, of Sarajevo because it's just you know, a huge part of you on small scale, like wallet size to the big scale of the, you know, on your wall. And I'm just wondering, and then the footage when you were sort of reunited with your dad, at first, the way you described it as being this kind of, you know, obviously very difficult, personal and kind of humiliating experience. But years later, when you got hold of the footage, it 
kind of, I mean, I'm sure it's still all those things, but the, the footage itself is like the recording of it. Uh, you can see some sort of beauty in it, right? In terms of uh, capturing and retelling that story that happened so long ago. So I'm wondering, um, do you wish you um, took, I mean, I know you weren't photographer during the war, but that you recorded more daily kind of experiences during the war um, to sort of capture those years now when we're, you know, 25 years and more beyond that? Like, do you think that would, because there's so many things, you know, memories that we thought for sure this is how it happened. And then you either find some evidence or somebody else is talking to you like, no, 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 it wasn't like that. So there's always these conflicting, um, you know, memories. So do, do you think like if, if you were dealing with photography during the war and captured a lot more kind of uh, of just daily life there, would that kind of transform your, um, the kind of archive that you have for those years? Well, it probably would, but, but I'm kind of glad I didn't. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, also there were other people for that and they, they did it wonderfully. And, uh, you know, like I did not even have a camera, you know, on, the, on that wedding day, uh, there was, you know, like some, sometimes camera would be there because somebody was there, but you know, it was, it was not, uh, it was also not a thing to have a camera at the time. It's better not to have one. And, uh, I uh, yeah do I wish no not really I mean I I, I really that's why I, I really cherish those few photographs that I have from this this period uh, much more than uh, you know like if I had a whole archive I, I feel like some of them would be lost in it uh, so no I personally yeah I'm kind of happy I did not record much of it you know to be honest yeah. Valuable, we have a question from Nerma. Um, so she's saying, thank you Valuable for a great talk. Apologies, I had to miss the first half. I wanted to ask you to talk a bit more about how you feel about exhibiting your work in Bosnia and if you had any negative reactions. Also, has the current pandemic affected your work and or your memories of the war? And if so, in what way? Uh, how do I feel about exhibiting my work in Bosnia? I feel great. I mean, no, I did not have any negative reactions that I know. Uh, like I exhibited uh, in Bosnia three, four times and it was always uh, a dream come true, you know. Like, I, I, you know, it's like it's, it's the best, it's the best scenario when you actually go back to Bosnia and you have something to do as well, you know, not just go to spend all your time in, in bars and restaurants, you know. So, uh, yeah, like that's, uh, uh, it's a always wonderful experience. I never had any negative reactions. And has the current pandemic affected your work? Yeah, because I do nothing. I'm not kind of paralyzed, so I, uh, I really don't do much during the pandemic. I teach, fortunately, so I, I interact with my students a lot. But uh, apart from that, I really did not do much. I did not write a book or learn how to read, uh, to play piano or anything else or another language. Um, like, uh, honestly, I enjoyed the first few months of this, but now I'm really sick of it. And I just can't wait for it to be done. Uh, yeah, my friend Thomas says not even running. Yeah, I picked up running of uh, old, and I, I was, I was one of those people that hated running, hated runners especially, and always I had always these fantasies that if I were a dictator for one day, that would be the first thing to ban runners on the streets, just to make us the rest of us feel bad. But then uh, May 21st, 2020, Valibor got out on the street to run for the first time. And I've been running ever since. It's like Forrest Gump, I've been running and not stopping. And I'll probably after this talk, I'm gonna go out running. So yes, Thomas, thanks. I did something that's kind of an achievement, right? I, uh, I started running. 
Yeah, so my work, uh, this pandemic affect my work? Yes, it did because it made me stop working pretty much. Like, I just don't feel like doing much, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I am preparing that there should be exhibition with this, uh, with this work about uh, these stories and conversations with Bosnians called Unfolding Elsewheres. And uh, I'm working on that a little bit. And that's gonna be here in Quebec in, uh, supposed to be in April 21, but we'll see. Nerma was also asking whether the pandemic affected your memories of the war, and if so, in what way? Memories of the war? No, not really. I mean, clearly, you, you start thinking, you know, now, now I think not in the beginning, but now I'm thinking, like, do I really need another siege? You know, like, I, I had enough of it. I lived almost four years under the siege. I just, like... Okay, uh, this is another year of being in a kind of a lockdown. I mean, it's like, it's annoying. So I, I get those little, you know, it's not like I have uh, nightmares or reflections on a siege because of the pandemic. I think they are the two very, very, very different things. Uh, very, very different experiences. And, uh, but you know, it's, uh, I also understand how, how this thing can be very traumatic for the many people, uh, especially young people who never experienced anything traumatic in their life. And, uh, you know, I have, uh, my daughter is 19, you know, I can, I mean, she's doing well, but I really feel for these kids to live a whole year of your life in a situation like this. So uh, it's not easy. Hi, Bagmore. Hey, Maggie. <laughs> I'm curious about um, going back to your work, My Prisoner, how, I guess what that means intergenerationally. So you, you know, what that, how that was making work about your father and you. So what that meant maybe for your father or even your children and how that might change over time. Oh, what's well, an interesting question. I mean, my father never saw the work. I, I, I showed him the, the original footage you know, because uh, I find it more interesting <laughs> than my work. And for, for him, surely it would be. And, you know, we looked at it. We didn't really talk much. We never really talked much about this whole experience. Uh, almost not at all. Uh, it was more through my mom that sometimes I would get some information. But uh, the... And, it, and this is not like we don't have any problem in our relationship. It's just that that's the kind of relationship, you know. And uh, we really ne never talked much about the war and this particular ex episode, not much, except at that one point when I showed him the, the original footage. Uh, my children, that, that's more interesting. Like they, you know, for my son is 23 now. He was born in Sarajevo in 97. And he was like 10 months old when we left Sarev. And uh, he grew up here, you know, completely oblivious to that whole history. And, uh, you know, and I was never one of those, uh, neither me or my wife, like feeding children with, you know, uh, you know, you are from Bosnia. You, you know, like, there's lots of people who I, I witnessed who kind of live in these little ghettos, you know, like, uh, uh, they only have friends from Bosnia. They only, you know, it's like, uh, if I want that, I would be living in Sarajevo. I would torture myself in Montreal, you know. So, like, so my kids also, like, you know, they were really quite oblivious until they hit that age, 17, 18, you know. And then they, when they have a first summer in Sarajevo, when they could actually drink and smoke and, you know, stay all night uh, unsupervised and, you know and see how the, like the different way of socializing that they really became interested in, in Sarajevo. Uh, and through that became a little bit interested about our lives, you know, and uh, especially <laughs> during the pandemic, because they all, you know, my son is in some graduate program and my daughter is at college and they do all these projects and they have nobody, 
you know, so uh, to interact with, and they have to do all these assignments where they would interview people. So they both interview me like for three different classes each, you know, about this whole experience. And uh, so now, now it's now it's there. We they know about all of this, you know, but uh, you know, there are no visible traumas yet. And, uh, and I hope never will be, but uh, yeah, so it's interesting. It's interesting, this whole intergenerational thing, but you know, it's also so much, so much about character because my, my, my father, you know, he's like just that kind of guy. He does not share much and never did, and never will. And, you know, so we never really discussed all of this. Uh, partially because I also didn't want to know, you know, I, I think, you know. Uh, just a quick question. Do your kids feel, I mean, I know they basically grew up in Canada, uh, but do they, do they just say, do they feel 100% Canadians or do they even throw in the little sprinkle, but my family is from Bosnia originally, like, is that even part of their identity at all? Well, that's, you know, the kids are so different, you know, in my case, I have two children and my son was, uh, I remember when he started elementary school, so he was very young and I would come to pick him up in the schoolyard after school and I would speak in Bosnian to him and he would almost like, you could see that he didn't want to have part of it, that he wanted just to blend in, you know, speak English or French because here it's, uh, you know, but no, no, not Bosnian. Like that, 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 for the longest time, it was like that. While my daughter, so based on that experience, when, when my daughter, who's four years younger than him, when she started school and I would go to pick her up and I would start speaking English to her and she would switch to Bosnian immediately in front of her friends because she somehow felt that, you know, like it would make her more interesting. You know, the friends would be like looking at her, like, what is that? You know, they would be asking questions, you know? So she, she, she took advantage of it while he was pushing it away, you know? So the two of them in the same household, completely different uh, attitude toward, towards that identity until they hit, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. And now they, they you know, they, they, proudly say that they are from Bosnia you know, and that they are from Bosnia but that the family is from Bosnia you know and they you know, but it's also something that we never really when they were young kind of forced them into you know so they they I mean the beauty of children growing up immigrant children especially growing up in Montreal is because uh, by law here immigrant kids have to go to French schools uh, all the way through high school. So, so they become fluent in French, they become fluent in English anyway, because it's just everywhere, you know, and then they, they are fluent with the home, uh, whatever the language they speak at home. So basically immigrant kids here are trilingual by the age of eight, you know, which is a huge, huge thing for, 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 for them, I think, through life. They pick up one more language. And I'm a little bit obsessed with that because I, I know when the war started and, you know, some will probably know, like uh, all these people who spoke English and French, you know, they, they kind of find a way to, you know, to infiltrate this international organization and work with journalists and, you know, like they, but uh, those that didn't, they did not have those choices, you know. So I think it's important to speak as many. And for kids here, it's, uh, it's wonderful because very early on, they, they, you know, pick up a few languages with no problem because they are like sponges. But yeah, so they, they, they love going back now to, to Sarajevo. They love that part of that identity, you know, and, uh, but they are Canadian, they are Quebecois, they are Montrealers, you know, first and before anything else, for sure. I do have another question um, about the, the, one of the last projects that you're working uh, together with uh, Sasha Hemon. Um, 
So you've been interviewing like many Bosnians, um, I don't know, in the past couple of years, maybe? Yeah, well, we, we, we started in 2016 and those 2016, 17, 18, we did quite a few. We have almost 30, but I mean, interview is really a bad word. It's not an interview. It's like we travel, we go, we meet these people that's prearranged, obviously, because uh, like every Bosnian has a story to tell. I, I, I firmly believe that, but uh, you know, not everybody wants to tell their story of course with the reason and so you have to find people who have the story and people who want to talk you know and feel feel like talking so uh these conversations are anything from four hours to three days you know like we would go and so we we traveled extensively through north america canada and us but also we went to europe uh, we did one interview in india and uh, yeah, and there are a few more that we are planning to do, but also, you know, there are other things. So, you know, Sasha is always writing four books at the same time. And, you know, so it's, uh, it's complicated, it's a long process, but also there's no you know, real rush. But we, uh, these are, you know, like I made friends, you know, with people, some of these people, three or four, I knew from before, but uh, the rest I, I really met for the first time, and these were really uh, fantastic uh, experiences, you know, and such fascinating stories. Yeah. So you started like 2016, so probably these people, in average, like they must have left Bosnia like 20 years ago or so. And yeah, they, they were all. They all left. They all left during the war, mm -hmm. pretty much, and most of them were were left forcefully through, you know, during the war. So, uh, and then they, you know, different refugee camps or whatever. And now they ended up wherever they ended up, and they they made life for themselves. Uh, yeah. I'm not asking you to go into details about what these people were telling you. I'm just curious if there's something, maybe something that some of them would say that would stay with you, you know, after the, these conversations. I mean, what were your impressions after meeting all these people living in different parts of the world, but sharing like a very um, traumatic loss? How, how rich every life is, you know, and how, I mean, Clearly, everybody went through trauma to, to get there, but also the strength and, the, you know, like everything that people, you know, many, many things I will never forget, the things I heard that I really shouldn't be sharing in this kind of environment. But, you know, it's like people went through unreal, you know, unimagin unimaginable pain and, and moments in their lives. And then, just, you know, like you, you realize... When, when you when you go through these long conversations, you know, everybody's at first a little hesitant, even though they, they agree to talk, but once they start talking, once the story starts, there's just like, it has to finish, it has to go all the way, you know? But that's also partly cultural. We love to talk, don't we? Like, we, we love to share stories, you know? Like, my whole upbringing was around coffee table in a cafe like I was not raised by my parents I was not raised by 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 Tito you know I was raised by my friends and that surrounding that that was constantly you know barrage of stories everybody was a storyteller and uh, so that you know when you, when you meet these Bosnians that live in Charlotte on St. Louis or in Brussels you know they, they after a while this comes out you know and then you know, like you don't start start a story. If you do, you you intend to finish it. You know, so that's why these conversations are very long. And and uh, yeah, but this you know, like also you realize how much chance, how much coincidences, how much uh, how much decisions had to be made, like in a split moment in, in people's lives. To you know, the decisions that were completely altering their life. You know and how many of those happened you know you 
the circumstances were just, uh, you know. And so, yeah, it's uh, all of that, you know. I don't, some people live through through unimaginable pain, and uh, I'm not going to talk about it now. But yeah, there are many stuff that I will never forget that I heard. That it's simply, yeah unforgettable but those that's why we have Sasha so he's gonna write those stories and you're gonna be able to read them in the book one day uh, we have a question from Enrico um, thanks Veva for sharing your work and your story I'm interested on the alteration of memory by time versus photography or video alteration of memory Uh, well, I'm getting old, so for sure time, time does its thing, you know, so I, I struggle with memory, you know, and uh, uh, photography, as much as I was talking about, about uh, being conflicting sometimes with, with the memory, also often reveals something that you can't remember, and, you know, like all of a sudden you see the image, and it, it helps you go through that, and to recall certain things. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's the memory is clearly, you know, as you know, and recall, it's clearly uh, influenced by, by both of these things. And uh, I think the, the, the only thing that, the thing that's different is that we accept this uh, time influence on memory. You know, we kind of, you are, you know, you know that as you get older and you're really going to start remembering, start forgetting things, you know. But with uh, but the photography or when you, when you see a, a recording of something of you, that's something that you experienced. And, and your memory of that experience is a little bit different than the clearly visual representation of it that's recorded. That's a little bit more like like a punch, you know, like that, that, that's, that's something that, uh, that's a little bit more of a violent act than just forgetting something because of the time. And, and I find that very interesting that that, that can actually happen at all, and uh, but it does. It happened in my case here. And now, obviously, you start to question all your memories. Like I don't know now stuff that I remember. How much of it is constructed? How much of it really actually happened? Because I remember this particular thing. I had this concrete memory of Zvonko Maric here myself, Zonko Maric, and then my father next to him. And he's passing the mic microphone and asking us question. I've for 20 years, I remember that. That's that's what happened. And then my father said, who's Onko Maric? I've never heard of this guy. Who is this? You know, and then he, then I look at this video and sure enough, I was also interviewed by, by a woman. So it's, uh, it's uh, then, you know, like what else did I construct? Now I understand where, where my memory comes from because Onko Maric was such a figure in the news every night we were bombarded with reporting by Zvon Komaric from here, there, and anywhere. And then he was there when I was there because he was the one who actually sent me the disc at the end of the day because they did not have the, the archive. In the archive on the Bosnian TV, they don't have this material because during the war they had to re-record over and over because they, as you and Rico probably know, but uh, Zvon Komaric had a copy and he's actually the one who sent it to me. Uh, so, yeah, interesting questions. And also Anna, Anna spoke a lot about, you know, this whole psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. And because, you know, I, 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 I talk about this, uh, you know, transition from my engineering world and in, uh, in, in, to become a student in photography quite casually as if that was, you know, but that did not happen so easily. I actually fell apart at one point in 2006. I, it started by I was driving home and all of a sudden I just, I just lost, like I couldn't, I had to lay down as I was driving. I barely got home. I couldn't even walk into the 
apartment. I was sitting on the street until my wife came, you know, like, and then a few times I ended up in emergency room. They would do all these kind of scans. Nothing ever revealed itself as a problem, you know, I was like, I had no idea. I always, you know, I thought I have a stroke and then, you know, would end up in emergency. They, they looked at me and they said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. And until uh, one day they said, okay, where are you from? Well, you know, I'm, so, well, I'm from Sarajevo, from Bosnia, you know. So, oh, were you there during the war? So, yeah, sure. You know, and then they, you know, as soon as then, then they start talking about PTSD. So I, I was also sent to, the, to do the psychoanalysis which was a horrible experience in my case because I was really in trouble at that time and I needed immediate help. And psychoanalysis is not something that's going to provide you with the immediate help. So I come with this, talk to this woman who wants to talk about my mother and when I was two years old, you know, and I, so that didn't work out. And then, uh, then I was sent, I said, okay, I need somebody like a psychotherapist, somebody who can, you know, who can, slap me once or twice and you know fix me up and uh, so I ended up with this beautiful man he was working from home and so after a few sessions we, we became we really started you know talking nicely it was just beautiful and then at one point he says to me uh you know what? Because I was I was blaming all of this what's happening to me I was blaming it on my engineering job I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be in that world, corporate world. It sucks. I just don't want to be part of it. You know, I just did not want to accept that war or this whole experience had anything to do, do with me being, you know, in trouble. So I was denying that all the time. So obviously I was ranting about this to, to, to this psychotherapist. And at one point he's like, can I say something to you? I shouldn't be saying this. I don't want this either. I don't want to keep doing this. Like I have a dream to open a little restaurant or something, you know, just to do something. So and I, that cured me at that moment. I was like, really? You know, and then we started talking about that. The funny part is that, so this is maybe 2006. In 2008, I'm going to my very first class at Concordia University. And most of you probably don't know it's uh, like you you come from the metro and and you go up straight into the building where the fine arts is and uh, i'm going out of the metro this is almost two years after i had these sessions with this psychotherapist and i'm passing by and i look there's this uh, yoga juice place like a little they make smoothies and juices and stuff and i look and i see him behind the counter and I'm like, I couldn't believe it. I, I walked to him and it was like, what are you doing here? He says, well, I opened my, uh, my little dream, you know, whatever, business. And he's like, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to my first class. I left Bombardier. I'm like, I'm going to do this photography thing. And we laughed and it was a beautiful moment. But yeah, so it was unlike Anna's uh, thing you know like uh, psychoanalysis for me didn't work because I was in trouble at the moment you know and then uh, but this guy really did help me uh, there is a comment by uh, Emmanuel uh, hi valuable thanks for sharing your work I guess the fact that you work with film at the time helps a lot as you can go through your contact shit and follow the chronology of places and actions talking about memory yeah, but I mean, even with digital, you can you can place them in time because they have all this metadata, right? So it's, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's nice to look at the contact sheets and you know. But sometimes it's not that simple to, you know, because there, there are images. Because most of the time, as a photographer, I mean, I know Enrico is one, and uh, probably when you look at the contact sheets, you kind of remember each each one that you took, you almost remember the moment you took it and even why you took it, you know, but then every once in a while there would be this image that you have no idea, as if, as if there was a ghost photographer who took over your camera and took, uh, took an image. So yeah, I almost do remember. I'm a photographer too. <laughs> yeah. 
Very no. surprising, but not with digital. I can't turn on the computer and see thousands of pictures. We don't have too many pictures on digital. Yeah, we do. We absolutely do. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you you guys were in Sarajevo during the war. You took many pictures. I'm sure your archives are something else. You know, not so many. Yeah. Hi, Viv, I just have a question as well. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, I was also lucky enough to see some of it in, in Zemalski Museum, your exhibition with Azra and Amela. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, you were lucky enough, obviously you have a long-standing relationship with Sasha, but you were also lucky enough to work with Amela and Azra. And so there's this almost this network of diaspora, right? Bosnian diaspora that's, that's weaving together from many different disciplines. I just wanted to know if you are planning on doing anything more with them or are there any future plans of collaborating uh, with them any further? <clears throat> well, with Sasha, there's this ongoing thing, but uh, with others, I mean, there's nothing concrete, but we always talk about stuff, you know, and uh, especially with Amila, we are here close by and, you know, every once in a while, uh, she would send a picture or something that we should go there and you know this is what we also should do and you know so yeah there's always i'm sure there will be you know it's just a, at the moment there's nothing concrete uh, but uh, i'm sure there will be with time i i really feel fortunate that's that's uh, you know i have long lifelong friendships with people that i grew up with and uh, you know that that friendship just got stronger because of the experiences we went through and not, uh, you know, it was never in danger. And uh, and some people, you know, like Azra, I, I met uh, just a few years ago, you know, like it's, uh, I uh, never knew her from Sarajevo, you know, and, but yeah, I'm really, I, I cherish these, these collaborations with, uh, First, it's a fun process, you know, to work with people that also it's, uh, you know, that you share the cultural background, you know, all these references in life that's much easier to to navigate through than, than, than with somebody who does not have that experience. So, you know, I'm aware of that and I, but you know, I love all of these people, they're, they're my friends, you know, and that will always be the case and hopefully we will work some more, you know. I remember the monk, as I, for the longest time I had for a few years, I, uh, during the blogging years, I, I had this blog called Footballists. Uh, so, I, I'm gonna share this for a second, just so I'll find it and share it. Okay, how do I do this? Okay, come on. So I started this blog years ago where I would actually basically stop people on the street when I see them wearing a, you know, like a football jersey because I'm a huge football fan. And then I would just ask him why, why that particular team, you know, and it was, it was a great blog and there was uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, attention on the online world at the time. But I remember the moment, so anyway, you can look at that. I remember the moment that Damir Shagun said, oh, maybe I could contribute to your blog because at the time he was in Asia, in uh, Bangkok, I think. And it was the happiest moment of those days because all of a sudden there's another Bosnian, you know, right with the camera and we're gonna do this thing together. And we did for some time and then, then it just stopped. But, you know, I will use any opportunity to work, work with my friends and Bosnians because, you yeah, know, that's, it's just the best feeling. 
I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Valuable, there is another photographer following uh, the talk tonight. It's Todd in Brooklyn, and he's thanking you for generously sharing. And Todd is sending love at the speed of light from Brooklyn, New York. Thank you, Todd, for joining us tonight. A lot, uh, Todd, for sticking with us for two hours now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Well, I, I'm not sure I have any more questions for you, um, unless we still have time, I guess, if you guys have anything to say to Valibor, if we forget something. Um, you should have just organized a party with drinks now after all this, this series. Well, this. We, we can improvise <laughs> on Zoom. I think the Zoom meeting <laughs> until, um, until nine, so, I mean, we still have an hour on Zoom, like, we can hang out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just uh I really want to thank you for this amazing talk and uh and I want to thank uh, Velma Babic and Anna Chvorovic and uh Selma Chatovic Hughes for uh accepting Kuma's invitation to be part of this series. I'm just so happy that we uh managed to do this and you um accepted uh um, my invitation to come and share your work and, and your stories with us. Uh, I, I've been telling you uh, so many times like how much we all missed you in Sarajevo this year so um, and how much I was against Zoom and doing anything online with Kuma and then really I'm just uh, and I have to thank Leila for this because she really uh, pushed me with the architecture month in uh, in October and uh, that turned out to be actually a really nice event. And now I'm just happy that we decided to continue with these online conversations. And just let me say also that for me, as an Italian moving to Bosnia five years ago and meeting all these amazing people uh, living in Bosnia and Bosnians living abroad has been one of them, probably the most wonderful experience in my life because you guys have really, uh, inspired me so much um, as a person as a like in my work in my everyday life and I really feel I mean I do I know that I complain about Sarajevo sometimes or I mean often during winter especially but I know it's I mean I feel like super privileged of being here and I have great honor and pleasure to work with people like you so I'm just very grateful. I feel like I should, I know you know, but I feel like I should tell you one more time. Well, I, I often think like, okay, if there's one place to be in the lockdown, Sarajevo, you know. I have no illusion that's better than anywhere else. It's probably worse with all the smog and fog and God knows what, uh, but, but I guess it's a muscle memory, you know, for me. It's like, okay, if I'm in a lockdown, then I would really like to be there. So I kind of envy you a little. Coffee places are open, so you should envy us. Because yeah. we can not sit here. here and have a drink. Yeah. Here, nothing's open. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. Um, well, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone. So once again to Velma, Anna, Selma and Velibor um, and to all of you for joining uh, this conversation. Um, yeah, so Hella is saying thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, thank you so much from Vienna. Damir, thank you guys. Anna, thank you again. This was another amazing talk. Uh, Yoshlin, thank you for the wonderful sharing. Amazing. Thanks, Beba from Dario. And Jivali. And Jivali, yes. Uh, well, we, we, miss, we miss a drink, but Jivali. Uh, it's time now. Yeah, it's time. it is about time. What time is it in Montreal? Is it two o'clock in the afternoon? I'm in, I'm in uh, Normandy. No, sorry, I was asking. Um, ah, it's, sure. it's two o'clock. Valuable because I know there is a big time difference. It's two o'clock.
It, you were asking me? <laughs> Sorry. I was asking Valuable, but uh, what, what time is it in New York? Uh, uh, two, two o'clock. Two, 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 two o'clock. Two, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Yeah, uh, Lovorik has also saying Hvala Weber with a lot of uh, exclamation points. Okay, thanks everyone. Hvala puno. Uh, Victoria also, thank you Velibor, thank you everybody. Velma also, Hvala puno, Velibor and Hvala Claudia. Thank you, I mean, thank you really, it's been, it's been great, so. Okay. Ciao then. Claudia. Yes. What about Aries? Yeah, I I didn't know whether should I, I should bring that up now. You tell me, tell everyone what you should tell me. Well, okay, so uh, we will announce it tomorrow, I think, or Saturday. But basically, we cannot stop holding conversation online. So I asked a friend of Kuma and a friend of mine, uh, Professor Haris Halilovic, who teaches in, in Australia and Melbourne, and he's an anthropologist. So he will actually um, have another online talk next week, uh, I think the 18th of December at 10 in the morning because of the time difference with Melbourne. And he will talk about uh, Bosnian writers in diaspora. So it is something that we haven't announced yet. Uh, but this, that will be like the last talk, like officially uh, closing this 2020 at Kuma. So yeah, I wasn't sure about mentioning it tonight or not, but OK, Rico, thank you for reminding me that. Um, but um, you'll receive an email with all the details. But it would be amazing to. Uh, to see you again uh, next week. I, it should be, I think it's a Friday, the 18th of, of December. And it's the first time actually at Kuma we will talk about, uh, specifically about literature and um, writers in Bosnian writing in diaspora. So I'm really looking forward to Hari's uh, lecture. But we will announce it officially um, tomorrow or over the weekend. So you. Sorry, grazie mille. <laughs> Grazie a te. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. That will be it, I think, for tonight, for today. Anna. Thank you, Valuable, once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Good evening.